It was only in the last decade that all reservists in the UK Armed Forces became entitled to a pension, but there is still much confusion around it all. Let's solve that. Hey everyone, and welcome to The Savvy Squaddy. In this video, I'm going to explain the various different pension schemes available to reservists, both past and present. Just a couple of caveats before I get into it. I'm not a professional financial advisor, just a guy on the internet. Do your own research and seek out professional advice should you need it. I'm also not a reservist, and whilst I have done a lot of research for this video, I may have missed out some of the nuances that come with being a reservist that might not necessarily be included within the regulations in GSPs. So if I have missed something out, please let me know in the comments below, but I will try to include as much as I can. Links to all my sources are in the description below. There are also time codes in the description that will help you navigate the video if you are after a specific scheme or topic. No need to sit through the whole thing if it's just the AFPS 15 that affects you. So let's get into it. There are four pension schemes that I will cover in this video. The Full-Time Reserve Service Pension Scheme 1997 or FTRS 97, the Reserve Forces Pension Scheme 2005 or the RFPS 05, the Non-Regular Permanent Staff Pension NERPS, and the Armed Forces Pension Scheme 15 or the AFPS 15. Now, three of these are legacy schemes. That means they are no longer open to new members. However, if you were a part of these schemes in the past, the pensions you accrued on them will still be paid to you if they are not already in payment. The only remaining pension scheme for reservists is the AFPS 15, and this is open to all reservists, something that was previously not an option in the other schemes. I will be giving broad and basic overviews of the legacy schemes, but will be going into more detail with regards to the AFPS 15 purely because we will be here all day otherwise, and the majority of my audience are impacted more by the most current scheme. So, first up, the FTRS 97 Pension Scheme. This scheme was based on the principles of the AFPS 75 and did not require you to contribute to the pension, but this is the same for all the Armed Forces pensions. For this scheme, a number of conditions had to have been met to be eligible for it. The first one being that you had to have given service before the 6th of April 2005. And this is because from then on, FTRS 97 was closed to new entrants and those starting new commitments. Those people would then continue on the RFPS 05, which I'll come on to in a bit. The second one being that you must have undertaken a period of full-time reserve service, a special short service commission, or a special S-type commission, both of which started on or after the 1st of November 1997. And the third and final condition that must be met was that you were not in excluded service. These were posts where duties were performed outside the UK, posts that were designated for locally employed people, and also if the terms under which you were engaged to serve excluded you from being part of this scheme. All three of these conditions needed to be met for you to be eligible to be part of this scheme. You'd have also not been a member of this scheme had continuity of pension rights in another occupational pension scheme or personal pension scheme continued during the period of full-time reserve service. So, what would you get under this scheme? Under FTRS 97, you would get an annual pension and a lump sum, but how that pension was calculated was different depending on the type of commitment you undertook and providing you had completed at least two calendar years of qualifying service. For those who were on full commitment, full-time reserve service, a special short service commission, or a special S-type commission, then the amount of annual pension payable is calculated by multiplying the amount of your final pensionable earnings by the number of years of reckonable service and multiplying that by 1.5%. Now, if you are on home commitment full-time reserve service or limited commitment full-time reserve service, then your annual pension is calculated the same way as before, but instead it is multiplied by 1.25% and not 1.5%. In both of these cases, a tax-free lump sum is also payable, which is three times that of your annual pension. So as a very basic example, Joe completed 15 years of full commitment full-time reserve service his final pensionable earnings were £28,000. So after doing the math, that means he will get an annual taxable pension of £6,300, which is £525 per month, and a tax-free lump sum of £18,900. But when can Joe claim all this? Well, if he leaves the service on or after normal pension age, then the pension and lump sum are paid immediately upon leaving. If he leaves before normal pension age, then the pension and lump sum are not immediate, they are paid once he reaches normal pension age. Under the FTRS 97 pension scheme, normal pension age is 55 years old for those who are on one of these commitments and age 60 for those on one of these two commitments. So that is a broad overview of the FTRS 97 scheme. 
it is a legacy scheme that many of you who are watching don't need to worry about as it won't affect you. In April 2005, the FTRS 97 scheme was replaced by the Reserve Forces Pension Scheme 2005, which was introduced at the same time as the AFPS 05. The RFPS 05 was only open to those on full-time reserve service commitments, additional duties commitments, and for those part-time volunteer reservists who were mobilised and who chose to join the scheme. For PTVR, no mobilisation, no pension. You would have automatically become a member if you had started or restarted one of these commitments on or after the 6th of April 2005. Membership would have started on your first day of paid service and the benefits could be accrued for up to a maximum of 40 years, but you still required two years of qualifying service. Those who were still serving on a commitment under the FTRS 97 pension scheme were given a chance to transfer over to the RFPS 05 for the remainder of their contract. Had you done this, you would have known. Had you stayed on the FTRS 97, then any new subsequent commitment you started would have been on the RFPS 05. Under this scheme, you would get an annual pension and a one-off tax-free lump sum worth three times that of your annual pension. The pension was calculated for each period of service and was based upon reckonable service at the end of your engagement. If you had multiple periods of service whilst under the RFPS 05, then each period would be calculated separately and when the pension becomes payable, inflation will be taken into account and they will be added together. The resulting sum will be your pension. Each year of reckonable service is worth 1 70th of final pensionable pay and your final pensionable pay for that engagement is the greatest amount earned over a 365 consecutive day period within the last three years of your engagement. So, for example, Joe has completed a 10-year engagement. In his last 12 months, he had 300 days on an annual salary of £30,000 and 65 days on an annual salary of £32,000. Because these are annual salaries, we need to work out what his actual salary was for the relevant periods of time to get his final pensionable pay. To do this, we need to divide 300 into 365 and then multiply that answer by 30,000. That then gives Joe a pensionable pay for that period of £24,657.53p. We then do the same for the 65 day period and that gives Joe a pensionable pay of £5,698.63p. Add the two together and Joe has a final pensionable pay of £30,356.16p. So, to calculate the annual pension Joe will get, multiply his final pensionable pay by the number of reckonable years service in this engagement, which is 10, and then divide that by 70 to get 1 70th. That then gives Joe an annual pension of £4,336.59p. As this was his only engagement, divide it by 12 to get his monthly pension payment, which would be £361.38p. Bear in mind, this is before tax. The annual pension is taxable income. His lump sum, which is tax-free, would be three times his annual pension, coming in at £13,009.77p. But when will the pension be payable? Well, if Joe serves until he is 60, then the pension will be paid immediately. But if he leaves service before he turns 60, then it becomes a preserved pension, payable at the age of 65. The preserved pension must be claimed for, it is not automatic. Claim it from Veterans UK six months prior to payment. You can get your preserved pension paid early at the age of 55, but the amount will be reduced due to it being paid out over a longer period of time. Pensions that are very small can be converted fully into a lump sum payment. This is known as trivial commutation. The limit here was £18,000 total pension rights, but that rose to £30,000 on 27th of March 2014. If your pension rights were more, then you cannot do this. Also, 75% of this lump sum is taxed at the normal pay-as-you-earn rate. Staying on the topic of commutation, you can opt to inversely commute your tax-free lump sum payment. This would mean giving up a portion or all of your lump sum to increase your annual pension that is either payable to you or to you and your dependents in case of your death. Sadly, the rates are not that simple and very much depend on the age and sex of the person receiving the pension. If you choose to do this, seek professional advice. This needs to be applied for six months prior to the pension becoming payable. And there you have it, the basic need to know information when it comes to the Reserve Forces Pension Scheme 05. Next up is the Non-Regular Permanent Staff or NERPS pension. This is a pension scheme that won't apply to the majority of you, but this will be a quick overview of the scheme for those few that might need it. Now, for those of you who don't know, NERPS are the permanent staff of the reserves, although they are a dying breed as they stopped recruiting a while back, and this scheme actually closed to new applicants in 2011. So just like the FTRS 97, there are also three conditions that must be met to be a member of this NERPS scheme. The first one being that you must have been a member of the non-permanent regular staff the day before the 1st of September 2011, 
and continued to be a member afterwards. The second being that you had not ceased to be in pensionable service or that you opted back into pensionable service the day before the 1st of September 2011. And finally, you were not in any pensionable service under any other occupational pension scheme. All three of these must be met to be entitled to a pension under this scheme. The annual pension is calculated similar to the RFPS 05 pension scheme. Final pensionable pay multiplied by reckonable service and divided by 80 to get 180th. The tax-free lump sum is then three times the annual pension. Also, similar to the RFPS 05, the maximum length of reckonable service you can do is 40 years. So when can it be claimed? Well, normal pension age for this scheme is 60 years old. If you leave service on or after your 60th birthday, then the pension becomes payable immediately. If you leave service before then, then you will have to wait until your 60th birthday before it becomes payable and you must claim it as well. Now that was a really quick overview of the NERPS pension. There are a lot of nuances to all these legacy schemes that I have missed out. The video would be far too long to include every eventuality in every aspect of each scheme. All the sources to each scheme are below. Check them out if you require further information regarding the final details or seek professional advice. On the 1st of April 2015, the Armed Forces Pension Scheme 15 was introduced and this was the first pension scheme to be applicable to all reservists, including part-time volunteer reservists. However, some benefits that are available to regulars under this scheme are not available for reservists, but I'll cover those in a bit. If you join the service on or after the 1st of April 2015, then you were automatically enrolled into the scheme. You were also automatically moved to the scheme if you were in service before that date and did not have transitional protection in another armed forces pension scheme. This meant for reservists that were under the age of 50 on the 1st of April 2012, then they were automatically moved to the AFPS 15 on the 1st of April 2015. However, any pension that they accrued on previous schemes will still be honoured. Under the McLeod Remedy, everyone who was allowed to remain on their legacy schemes due to transitional protection moved to the AFPS 15 on the 1st of April 2022. So, everyone, both regular and reserve, are now on the Armed Forces Pension Scheme 15. If you are one of the affected people from the McLeod Remedy, the full remedy solution and how it will be implemented should be sorted towards the end of this year. You must have at least two calendar years of qualifying service to be eligible for a pension under this scheme. If you have time in previous schemes between the 1st of April 2010 and the 31st of March 2015, then these years will count towards qualifying service as well. Also, if you had a break in service which was less than five years, then the previous years of service will count too. If your break was over five years, then you will need to complete another two years of qualifying service to be eligible for a pension. The AFPS 15 uses a system known as Career Average Revalued Earnings to calculate the pension. This just means that your pension is calculated according to the average earnings over your whole career. The pension will start to build up from your first day of paid service. Each year, the MOD adds 1 47th of your annual pensionable earnings to your pension pot, and each year this pot increases in line with inflation. This continues every year of service you complete, and unlike some of the previous schemes for reservists, there are no caps on the maximum amount of years of service one can complete on this scheme. The AFPS 15 mixes really well with both a regular and reserve career, and just like the other schemes, this is a non-contributory pension. That means you do not pay into it. When it comes to a lump sum, the AFPS 15 does not offer an automatic lump sum like the previous pension schemes do, but a tax-free lump sum can be created through the process of commutation, essentially giving up part of your annual pension to create a lump sum. You can give up a maximum of 25% of your annual pension. For every £1 you give up, you will get 12 towards your lump sum. You must make this decision six months prior to the pension being paid, and once you made it, it cannot be reversed. So make sure your annual pension left over is sufficient enough. So when will you be able to claim this pension? Well, normal pension age for the AFPS 15 is 60 years old. So if you stay in service until you're 60, then the pension will be paid immediately. If, however, you leave before you are 60, it will become a deferred pension payable at state pension age. A deferred pension must be claimed for around six months prior to state pension age by Veterans UK. You can claim the pension early at 55, but it will be less due to it being paid out over a longer period of time. And once a pension is in payment, it increases each year in line with inflation. On the AFPS 15, regulars who serve 20 years and leave after they turn 40 are entitled to EDP, or Early Departure Payment. 
and I've done a whole video on this which I will link below if you're interested. However, reservists are not entitled to this benefit. If a regular leaves before their 20 year point and so is not entitled to EDP but has served over 12 years, then they are entitled to a tax free lump sum payment of just under £12,000. This is called a resettlement grant. Again, reservists are not entitled to this. So, if a reservist decides not to use commutation, they will not get a tax free lump sum at all under this scheme. I will cover what happens to these benefits should you join the reserves from the regulars a bit later on. You can also opt out of the scheme if you so choose, but it is important that you seek independent professional financial advice as to whether or not this is a good idea. I'm not that person. But you can be a member of the AFPS 15 and be a member of a civilian occupational pension or have a personal pension plan all at the same time. If you are mobilised and want the MOD to pay your employer's contributions to your civilian pension, then you must opt out of the AFPS 15. The MOD will only pay employer contributions if you have opted out of the Armed Forces Pension Scheme 2015, your civilian employer has ceased pension contributions into your pension and you are still contributing to that pension. And there we have it. Hopefully now you have a better understanding of the pension schemes you are a part of. I have left out things like ill health benefits, dependence benefits, divorce, transferring in and out of schemes, allocation, nomination and some other finer details. I will be doing videos on some of these topics in the future, so subscribe so you don't miss those, or read the source material which is linked below. But I want to finish this video up by talking about what happens when you join the reserves after serving in the regulars, as there are some things that people may fall foul of, like having to partially repay lump sums, or if their pension is in payment, it could be reduced or even stopped. It is important to understand that if you leave the forces and rejoin whether that be back to the regulars or reserves and the gap in service is less than 5 years then your pension account will not close and any new service will continue to be added to it. However, if the gap is more than 5 years then your pension account from your previous service will close and a new account will be opened for you and you will have to complete 2 calendar years of qualifying service again. Don't worry though your pension account from your previous service is not lost it will still be paid to you when the time comes. When it comes to the resettlement grant, there may be occasions where it needs to be repaid in full. These two occasions are if you rejoin the regulars or the full-time reservists within 31 days of leaving. You will not have to repay it should you join the part-time volunteer reserves. However, if you rejoin the regulars, you will be entitled to another resettlement grant should you meet the criteria again. Bear in mind though that FTRS are not entitled to the grant and so if you join them within 31 days, you'll have to pay it back and you will not be entitled to another one. If you rejoin in any capacity after 31 days, then you will not have to repay it, but naturally you won't be entitled to another one. But what about if you have EDP in payment? Well, on the AFPS 05 scheme, if EDP is in payment and you rejoin the armed forces, either as a regular, FTRS, ADC or NERPS, then your 05 EDP income will stop. You may also have to pay back some of the lump sum you received as part of the EDP. For example, if your EDP lump sum was the same as 12 months pay and you rejoined after 3 months, then you would have to repay 9 months equivalent of the lump sum. Joining the part-time volunteer reserves has no effect on your EDP benefits and they will continue as usual. When you leave again, if you happen to be at normal pension age, then you will not be paid any EDP as your pension will be paid immediately. However, if you leave before normal pension age, which is 55 years old, on the 05 scheme, then the EDP benefits will depend on the type of service you just finished. If it was regular service, then the EDP income and lump sum will be recalculated to include your new service. But if it was an FTRS, ADC or NERPS commitment, then you will not get a lump sum as those commitments do not allow for EDP benefits. However, your EDP income will restart from your time built up in the regulars if you leave before normal pension age. When it comes to the AFPS 15 EDP benefits, if you join the reserves in any capacity, the benefits will not be touched in any way. You will not have to repay the lump sum and the monthly income will not stop. However, there is no new calculation made to include that new service when you come to leave again as reservists are not entitled to the EDP benefit. If you happen to rejoin the regulars within 5 years, you have two options under the AFPS 15. 
You can either have it remain in payment and not repay the lump sum, just like if you join the reserves, and no new calculation will be made, or you can have the EDP income stop and repay the lump sum in full, and when you come to leave again, then a recalculation will be made to include your additional service provided you leave before normal pension age, which is 60 under the AFPS 15. But what if your pension is in payment? Essentially, under the AFPS 75 and 05 schemes, if you rejoin service with a pension in payment, your new rate of pay, including your pension, cannot be more than your previous regular rate of pay. If it is, then your pension will be lowered or stopped to bring its level, and this is called abatement. This will only really affect those who take up FTRS commitments. If joining the PTVR, then it's unlikely that this will happen to you. Even then, those on the AFPS 05 or the RFPS 05, the pension is not payable before the ages of 55 and 60 respectively, so these groups of people won't really be affected either by abatement. And when it comes to the AFPS 15, if you join the reserves in any capacity within 5 years of leaving the regulars, then your new service will just carry on building up your pension pot on that scheme and would be paid out to you immediately if you leave the reserves at age 60 or state pension age if you leave before 60. So if you're planning on joining the reserves after leaving the regulars, make sure you understand the implications that new service may have on your pension and benefits. Hopefully now you have a much better understanding of your pension entitlements if you are in the reserves or thinking of joining them after some time in the regulars. The implementation of pensions for part-time volunteer reserves is a good thing, overdue perhaps, but it's still a positive step. There are a lot more nuances to the reserves pensions, but I hope I have covered the main topics and have helped answer many of your questions you may have. Please remember to seek out professional financial advice to help answer your questions that are more pertinent to your own circumstances. Has this video helped you better understand your entitlements? Are you a regular thinking of joining the reserves? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you all for watching. If you liked what you just saw, please hit the subscribe button up there. And if you want to see some more videos, click over there. See you soon.